Thank you for joining us and welcome to another edition of Answers Network. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza. And if this is your first time watching or listening to the show, know that every Monday from 11 a.m. to noon Pacific time, this show will bring on special guests that can inspire, educate, and in some cases entertain, while bringing answers and options to making our lives happier, healthier, and more successful. Now, if you can't listen live, all of our shows, including this one, can be found at answers.network. And I'd really appreciate it if you could all do me a wonderful favor. Please forward one of our shows to your social media group and to someone you know who can benefit from a particular subject. Sharing my shows and others like it that focus on improved health, happiness, education, and success is one powerful way that we can make a positive influence in the world together. Now, our topic today is also the title of our guest's new book, Anesthesia Without Fear, The Informed Consumer's Guide to Safe Surgery and Chronic Pain Relief. Joining us today, Dr. James E. Cottrell is a past president of the American Society of Anesthesiologists and Chairman Emeritus and Distinguished Professor of the Department of Anesthesiology. He is the co-editor of Anesthesia and Neurosurgery, now in its seventh edition, and the author of more than 100 articles in medical journals. James served as a health policy advisor to Senator Edward M. Kennedy and the Senate Committee on Labor and Human Resources. He was a founding member and former chair of the AIDS Action Foundation and is currently a regent for the University of the State of New York. James, Welcome to Answers Network. Thank you, Alan. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I, I have had a wonderful time this week just learning more about you, learning more about anesthesiology. And um, and I think before we, we really go into what I've learned, um, can you share a little bit about yourself and what motivated you to get into the field of anesthesiology? Well, I think it started when I was a very young uh, and I had some experiences with my father having lung cancer. Mm. And it wasn't much pain relief, only opioids and narcotics. And those made him nauseous and vomit. And nothing else was available to him. So he was in, pretty, in pain most of the time, constipation. So I thought there's got to be a better way. And then I got some glass in my foot. And then the, the, the doctor kept probing in my foot to get the piece of glass out and used ethyl chloride as the anesthetic. And that really hurt. So I thought, oh boy, I, I really need to do something about this. So I did. <laughs> well, you certainly did. Um, you know, a lot of people would, in my case, you know, I would research it and figure out how to find the, the right person or something. Uh, you decided to not only get into the field, but become a leader in the field. Um, one of the things in your book that I really, uh, really liked was that you go into sort of a how-to book. You know, whereas, you know, for people that don't know anything about anesthesiology, which most of us don't, uh, things like the right questions to ask, things to where we can go in with more knowledge and hopefully help you do your job better. So, um, you know, how should you know, share with everybody? How should a patient prepare? How should they do the preparation prior to surgery? What do they need to do? Um, what should they tell the anesthesiologist uh, so that we can get the best outcome for everybody? Well, surgery and anesthesia is very stressful, as you know. Yes. So in order not to be so stressed, then if you have the information about what's going to happen to you and you have some say in what's going to happen, then I think you won't be as stressed. You can also ask about the complications and how can, they can be avoided. You can give the anesthesiologist all of your history so that you can see how that interacts with your anesthesia today. And there's just a lot of questions that you should be able to ask your anesthesiologist so you won't be as stressed. Well, uh, from a timing standpoint, uh, speaking to you now, um, I'm in kind of a different place. Uh, you know, I was someone who sort of believed that I was invincible and that, uh, didn't have to worry about these things because I didn't need to go to hospitals because I was in such great health. Unfortunately, I recently had a, a stint put in about a month ago and it was put in my heart. And 
what was I, I was put in what was called twilight. It was a twilight state. And what was odd for me was I could hear and see what was going on, and yet I couldn't feel anything. And at one point, I thought I wanted to say something, yet no sound came out. So can you explain this state and uh, why it is best in certain situations? Well, that's that's conscious sedation. I don't like to call it twilight sleep because that's what the dentist used in their office for, with nitrous oxide. Okay. But conscious sedation is used so that the patient can be arousable if they need to cooperate with the surgeon for any part of the operation. So we can awaken you easily and you can answer questions for the anesthesiologist or the surgeon. And we do that for a lot of procedures like bronchoscopies and colonoscopies and endoscopies. That's all conscious sedation where you don't lose consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, what, um, how long has this been available in this form? Uh, you know, in, in the sense that it makes so much sense to me, you know, that um, we could be there. I was, I was able to turn my head and look at what looked like an 80 inch TV screen and, and see him doing things to my heart. Uh, it was the most amazing thing uh, ever. And it just seemed like, um, you know, I, if, if that's the way that it can be done, I'm, I'm all for it. Right. And, and it's much safer for you too as a patient because we don't really alter your brain cells as much as we would with if you were totally out with a general anesthetic. You know, you can have regional anesthesia too for procedures and you can be awake and watching what goes on with the tele telecamera in the operating room. So we even do craniotomies now with patients watching the craniotomy being done under conscious sedation because we want them to be able to move parts of their body that we might be operating on at the time and make sure we don't damage it. So it's very, very good, good idea to use this conscious sedation in a number of, a number of cases. Wow. Um, yeah, it was certainly amazing to me. Um, I'm also at a new stage of life to where I'm, uh, you know, having to look at managed care, Medicare, things like that. And I'm finding that it's very difficult to negotiate. And, and I went through this a few years ago uh, with my mother as well. Um, how does a patient make sure that they get what they want and they need before and after surgery? Um, and um, you know what should they do to make sure that 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 they're okay, and you know, can they choose the anesthesiologist? Because I know that in in my situation, nobody said here, do you want this one or this one? It was we got you in here. This is what we're going to do. Um, and and I know you touch on on your book, and which is why I wanted to to bring it up now is. What's the best way for somebody to go in to negotiate these things to get the best outcomes for everybody? Well, when you choose your managed care contract, you look to see what they pay for. And sometimes they bundle the charges. So the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, and the hospital all get the same fee. And that's mm. the same fee whether you get extra equipment that might be needed for your post-op care or whether you come back with a complication from your operation. So of course you're not going to get the doctor's not going to get paid anymore. So why should they do this? You know, it's and so it's very difficult. And if you want to stay overnight, suppose you're having severe pain, like a, one of the patients in my book, and they say, "No, you got to go. The insurance won't pay for it." You got to know that the insurance will pay for that until your pain is relieved and you have some way to control it when you go home. So you got to look at your contract when you're getting your health insurance coverage. Okay. Um, we've got a question that's coming in, <clears throat> and this is from Betty in Ohio. And this one reads, um, I had surgery on my right hip a few months ago. Immediately after the surgery, I came down with aspiration uh, <laughs> pneumonitis, uh, which they uh, attributed, which, you know, which they attributed to the anesthesia. Uh, I believe it was compounded by the fact that I have had quite a few bouts with bronchitis since I was a small child. Uh, the doctors put me on oxygen and an antibiotic, and I was much better in about 10 days. They told me this was a rare event, but as they are recommending that I have a second surgery on my other hip next year, 
I have to say, I'm worried about this happening again. I would love to hear your opinion on this. And again, that's from Betty in Ohio. Well, I think Betty should know that she should have been able to ask questions about what is the best anesthesia for having her hip done. Usually, I, I would assume she's over 60 when she had this done. And usually people over 60 should have a regional anesthetic. That is a spinal or an epidural because then you're awake and you can't vomit and aspirate. Many people, many anesthesiologists might put you to sleep because it's much faster for them. And then during the time period before they get the tube in place in your lungs to breathe for you, something comes from your stomach and goes down into your lungs. So if Betty has another procedure, she should ask for a regional anesthetic and very light conscious sedation. Okay. And um, what if they say we don't offer that? Well, she can either ask for another anesthesiologist, if it's one anesthesiologist, or she could ask her surgeon to go to another hospital where they okay. might have it. And if that all fails, then she'll have to go with the general anesthesia, but she needs to tell the anesthesiologist what happened the last time. And they can take, take some precautions to prevent that from like happening. They can apply pressure to the throat while they're putting the tube in place, blow the tube up more quickly, and prevent any aspiration and make sure she's wide awake when the procedure is over so that she won't aspirate half asleep when they take the tube out. I like that. Um, yeah, and I, I, I love things to where we have we have more knowledge, we have more control in which, and, and by the way, I mentioned as we first came in for everybody listening, I mentioned the book. Um, that's what I enjoyed about reading the book was that I was being educated and in situations just like this to where it was, yeah, you can just ask, just ask the questions that you need, get the answers that you, uh, you know, that you want before you go in. And, right. and I like the fact that it's, it's so preventative, um, you know, that, that it allows us to, to feel better about the whole situation. Right. Right. Now, are there some people who just should not go under? And if so, who and why? Well, I think there if it I think there aren't many people that we can't give an anesthetic to. It may be risky and they may have a complication, but if they're in poor con physical condition and have a lot of comorbidities like diabetes and hypertension, a previous stroke or stents in their heart, then we have to take all of that into account and weigh the risk against the benefits. And then we choose the anesthetics that would cause the least harm or interfere with the other procedures that the patient has had. So it's very important that you tell the, the anesthesiologist about all these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what you're saying kind of fits with a, a situation that uh, my brother and I had with my mother. Uh, she had uh, deep brain stimulation put in, uh, but unfortunately she took a fall and broke the wire. and uh, they they couldn't go back in and hook it back up. They could just disconnect it, but they couldn't go back and hook it up because they didn't feel that that based on her age and everything that else that she was going through, that they had to wait until she was strong enough for anesthesia. Does that sound about right? Uh, well, it depends. I think some right. some anesthesiologists would take more risk than others. If she really needed this deep brain stimulator for day to day function. Or, you know, you, I think you'd rather that she have day, you know, better day-to-day -day function than not. So you might want to take a little more risk and go ahead. Okay. So and, and that makes sense because essentially she had the, the tremors, um, but the tremors weren't life-threatening. You know, it just, you know, she didn't like the fact that she shook on one side. Right. Um, but um, anyway, yeah, so that, that kind of makes sense that... Um, you know, that they were being uh, erring on the side of caution, I guess. Right. It's a very good procedure and it really works for Parkinson's. So she should, if she hasn't gotten it reconnected, she should go back and get it. Mm -hmm. Well, um, let's talk a little bit about um, kind of going from your knowledge with the history of anesthesiology, but I want to take that into the advancements and into the innovations. So what do you think have been some of the most significant advancements and in innovations uh, in regards to techniques or medication that, of, that you've witnessed, not only throughout your career, but 
things that you believe has made the greatest impact on improving outcomes for patients? Well, I think monitors have made a big difference. Monitors for safety, so that if mm -hmm. someone loses their respiration during the anesthetic, we have a monitor that tells us and sounds an alarm. If someone has a difficult cardiac arrhythmia, an alarm will sound and we can fix that. We also have a new monitor called the BIS monitor. We can monitor brain waves and tell them so we won't get the patients too deep and not have them too light so they can remember anesthesia. And we can get this with ultrasound, can get a look at the heart and see how it's doing during surgery. And we can give drugs and see a change, get better or worse, and, and take appropriate action. So we have to be able to see what happens before and after with all of these monitors. We also can monitor the spinal cord and brain when they're having brain surgery or spinal cord surgery. And that prevents any damage to the ner central nervous system during surgery. So the monitors have been tremendous uh, help to us, along with better anesthetic drugs. You know, we have drugs now that come and go very quickly, so they don't stick around. They cause problems post-operatively. We have some that you, you have no nausea or vomiting, so you're not sick after the procedure. And then with the regional, you can continue that into the post-op period for pain relief. You can even take that home with you and push a button and get more pain relief. So wonderful things have happened uh, in my career. You know, we no longer have to crack chest to do open heart surgery. We no longer have to crack heads to do aneurysms or AVMs. And we all we allow that to happen because we're able to manage the anesthesia and the changes in bodily function during the procedure. You know, that was one of the most um incredible things with the procedure that I went through because uh, <clears throat> when they when they told me that they were going to have to put a, a stint in my heart after after having a, a heart attack um, I didn't know that there were new procedures new things that could be done and, and I envisioned them cracking my chest right and and as you know but for anybody else out there um, they went in through my wrist and uh, and they said that, you know, that in most cases, I guess they go in through the groin, but they go in and went in with a camera. They were able to see everything that they were. I was able to see what they were doing. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, you know, the modernization of, of technology in what they're able to do. And, and as I said, in from an anesthesiologist standpoint to to have me at a point to where I could feel no pain and yet I could see everything that was going on was just phenomenal. Uh, yeah, it's really incredible. Before they had to open your chest up and put you on a bypass machine so that you had a heart beating outside your body. It was hard to keep, it's hard to keep your blood pressure up so your brain would have some abnormalities post-op and just all kinds of things that would happen. So we're really glad that we have stents. Yes. Yeah. I am so grateful. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you see as the future? For, um, for anesthesia? Well, I think we may not have to have the drugs that cause suppression of vital signs, you know, like respiration and cardiac. We may have electromagnetic fields that will induce anesthesia in a particular part of the brain, or we could have microdialysis catheters inserted to tell us what is needed or what isn't needed in terms of what, what's being manufactured in the body during the anesthetic. And then we could give something to counteract that. So there's, I think in the future, there's going to be a lot of things that, that can respond to the body changes in a second and, and, and change and alter if it's going the wrong direction. And you, you mentioned, or I mentioned that you had worked with some uh, government entities. Um, if I could give you a magic wand, what, were the, what would you do from a governmental standpoint? What changes would you make to allow... Uh, you know, medical technology, especially in the area of anesthesia, um, to move faster or to be able to help more people? Well, I think research and development is crucial in, in this aspect, and it's done on profit now. So the people who do the research have the idea that they're going to make money if they develop a monitor that's helpful. If you are a Medicare patient, you get the reimbursements the same for everybody. So if, and for, for every patient. But for the anesthesiologist, it's very low. So it's very hard to make any predictions about what Medicare could come up with to save 
the patient's life or add to their enjoyment. So Medicaid has an even lower reimbursement rate. So if we had, we could decide on a system that would pay everybody for a hard day's work and that was fair and equitable, then I think we'd all profit and benefit from that. Okay, so if, if you were leading the charge for that <clears throat> and you were reaching thousands, tens of thousands of people, what would you tell them to do to help us get in that direction? I think improve Medicare for all. Okay. Improve Medicare for all. Okay. So, but as far as the people, they need to put the right people in office to do that. What, you know, what, what do we need to do to take the step? Um, oh, it's, it's very hard in Congress to talk about uh, free medical care or discounted medical care because you know, many people don't want that to happen. They want to keep the HMOs in business and all the the the, the, the quality endeavors that they don't do, keep those going so it doesn't cost as much. I think if you're working in a private hospital, then uh, you get more of the advantages than if you go to a safety net hospital, for example, where they don't have all the needed bells and whistles that make it safe for you to have your surgery. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm just thinking, so, I mean, you know, as far as how, how we, the people can elicit change, I would guess then is to, to take the words that you've just said and go to their representatives and say that if you are not for this, we'll vote somebody in that is. Correct. Is that right? That's right. I like it. I mean, look what happened with Obamacare. That was became very unpopular with the new administration. And it was, yeah. they tried to rid of it. And now it's back. And I think it will improve as we go into the future and maybe something that we need and could use. Well, knowing with what I just went through and, and being able to go to uh, to a good uh, Hogue Hospital, a great hospital, right. and, and get the care that I got um, you know, through, through Medicare, I am eternally grateful. Right. Um, so we have another question that's come in. Um, <clears throat> so this one's from Jonathan in Arizona and it says, my nephew was diagnosed with autism just after he turned three. The symptoms began presenting a few days after he had dental surgery, um, you know, which had, had, <clears throat> excuse me, which had required a form of anesthesia. The doctor said the symptoms should clear up, but instead they've gradually become worse. My mother started doing research on sudden onset causes of autism and discovered that uh, an article listing the works of several well-known geneticists on the topic. One stated that anesthesia can trigger autism in, <clears throat> excuse me, in some children with mitochondrial dysfunction. We are upset that we were not recommended to do tests prior to the procedure as this child is now forever impaired with this condition. Could you, uh, could this have been a preventable condition and can you comment on this? You know, autism is a very difficult uh, condition for anyone to deal with. And there have been some studies that look at uh, behavioral and uh, personality disorders after general anesthesia in very young rats and animals. But none have actually documented those changes occurring in humans. Now, it, it does occur in rats. You can cause things that resemble autism in rats after they received, particularly an inhalation anesthetic rather than an intravenous anesthetic. So I think we have to, a lot more research to do before we can relate the two. Also, it could be a triggering mechanism for the genetics that causes autism to be expressed. And I think people are looking at that as well. So I don't know anyone who does testing for genetics for autism right now, but hopefully in the future, we'll get more answers from the research that we're doing. Yeah, I, I would love to see more, <clears throat> more research in regards to that. Um, we're going to take a break. Uh, the book is called Anesthesia Without Fear, The Informed Consumer's Guide to Safe Surgery uh, and Chronic Pain Relief. And again, I, I recommend to people that um, if you get a chance, get this book and know that when you're reading it, you just feel like you're being educated 
uh, in an area that is so much less scary once you know it. So we're speaking with Dr. James E. Cottrell. We'll be right back. You're listening to or watching Answers Network. Conflict International are experts at uncovering the truth. Our specialist team has decades of experience in providing a range of bespoke investigation and intelligence services to companies and individuals. Whether you need professional screening or background checks of employees, due diligence of potential clients or business partners, asset tracing services, or surveillance, Conflict International has a rapid response team on hand to get you to the heart of the matter. Our key strength is in our global capabilities. We can tap into an extensive network of trusted professional investigators based in most jurisdictions worldwide, enabling us to go almost anywhere a case takes us. Conflict International has decades of experience with a diverse range of skills among our team developed from backgrounds in military and security intelligence services as well as practiced lawyers. Visit our website today at conflictinternational.com to find out more about our services. That's conflictinternational.com. Global reach, local knowledge. And we're back. We're talking with Dr. Cottrell, and we are talking about anesthesia. Um, so, James, um, how do we know which form of pain control is optimal for us? Well, I think... There, there, there's a variety of experts now in the area of pain management, and they can be certified by the American Board of Anesthesia, and they can be neurologists, psychiatrists, uh, physiotherapists. So there's a lot of doctors now that are working in that area. And you have to identify the kind of pain that you have and what can be done about it. If you have, so if you have chronic pain over six weeks, then you have to look and see what happened. Was there an injury to, to a limb? And then you see the sympathetic changes to that, and you can do blocks and get rid of that pain. Uh, if you have cancer pain, though, there's no reason not to give opioids. And you can give a, a PCA, you know, patient-controlled pump, where they can push a button and get the, the drugs that they need to control their pain. But also, we can give blocks for pancreatic cancer, for head and neck cancer, and we can get blocks that last for a very long time, and, and patients can actually function well without without pain and the side effects of narcotics. Now, you, you mentioned opioids, and right now there's, it's, you know, obviously it's a huge topic um, all around the world, and especially here uh, in the United States. Um, how do you see this, this epidemic and how do you see us uh, getting getting through it and getting to a point to where it's being used where we need it and not being used where we don't? I think you said the right thing, getting used where it's needed, because there are places where we need to use an opioid, and we can't have someone coming in from the outside saying, you shouldn't have used that. You know, we had the commissions that... Uh, the great hospitals coming in and looking at the fifth vital sign and the fifth vital sign was pain and so if you got a lot of those with a high score in pain then the hospital would get dinged with poor quality of care so i think that resulted in the overuse of some of the narcotics and then when the patients went home they would have to do a follow-up and they were sending patients home with 30 days of, of opioids and you only need about three to five days so I think, you know, a lot of the regulations on the hospitals led to this, as well as a lot of other things. Well, again, let me give you the magic wand. What do we do to fix it? Well, I think we're doing it now. I think there's a lot of publicity about physicians or nurse practitioners being in the business of selling opioids. Mm -hmm. And also, there's now, and I know in New York, we have a course by by the state that tells you how much narcotic you can use and how many you can prescribe for your patients and what's the optimal for patient care. And if after you read that, it's like the pharmacology of narcotics and you realize that they don't need, you know, 30 days of narcotics. There are also alternatives to narcotics. You know, you can use physical therapy, you can use uh, mindfulness, you can use acupuncture, you can use, neuroleptics, you can use spinal cord stimulators, dorsal root stimulators, lots of things you can use before you start narcotics on patients with pain or chronic pain. 
I'm so glad that you brought that up because um, I think that's so important uh, in this day and age uh, where, you know, just just exercise or uh, just breathing, just meditation, so many things. Uh, I was told by the doctors and the paramedics that dealt with me that a combination of the conditioning that I was in, the fact that I went directly into a mindfulness meditation and 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 breathing exercises as soon as the heart attack hit and the fact that the paramedics were there in two minutes mm -hmm. and the hospital was only a mile and a half away the combination of all of those things they believe saved my life um so to to be able to have a, a platform like this to be able to tell people that these things do matter you know it's you know they you know, essentially, I had one person that said, um, you know, that if I was, you know, if I was 350 pounds and diabetic and was, you know, you know, 15 miles from the closest uh, paramedic or doctor or hospital, I probably wouldn't be here. Right. That would be our nightmare. Yeah, exactly. So, so, you know, so the fact that you bring up all of these other things and the fact that they are important um i think yeah. it's wonderful yeah we're recommending prehab to many patients who aren't in good shape that are going to have major procedures you know you can get do prehab work with knee replacements with uh any kind of orthopedic surgery replacements if you're going to have open heart surgery if it's not an emergency you can do things to alter your diet your smoking your high blood pressure your diabetes so there's lots of prehab work you can do you can also exercise your brain a bit and, and mm -hmm. get that, give that some something to draw on. If you happen to lose a few neurons, then they, they'll come into play. The new ones will. So it's very important prehab. I love that. Um, so, so give us some examples of um, brain exercise. Oh, I think crossword puzzles, playing games with your friends, just having social contacts with your friends. I think that's yeah. important. Yeah, I mean, just the mini crossword in the New York Times every day. It's, it's a challenge, so it's good for your brain. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. Um, so let's let's go a little deeper into the book. Um, share some of the things that people are going to find as they're going through the book. Well, I think it's very important to remember that you need to choose your anesthesiologist that's related to your condition. So if you're going to have open heart surgery or stents put in, you need a cardiac anesthesiologist. They're specially trained. They have a year of extra training. They have all the knowledge of the new monitors and bells and whistles that can save your life. If you have a child going for anesthesia, you need a pediatric anesthesiologist. Mm -hmm. because the, the physiology in a pediatric patient is totally different than an adult patient. And they're small things, you know. They're, they get into trouble very quickly. So you need somebody who's really expert at handling those, those, those kids. So I think it's very important for that. And neuroanesthesiology is also very important to have someone who knows about the effects of anesthetic on the brain, the physicians, the monitors that we use that are specialized. So all of these are very, very important. Also, the, the, one of the other things that's critically important is if you have a, a long procedure, a complex procedure, there should be a critical care unit in the hospital where they have critical care doctors 24-7 because they can take care of you and save your life in a matter of seconds rather than have to call someone from home. So that's another good question to ask. So ask for the specialist you need and then ask if they have the post-op care facilities that, it, that will keep you in good shape. So what would you say is the most worrisome situation that you've ever found yourself in, uh, in this profession? Well, I think that the most, well, pediatrics is very difficult, but I don't do pediatric anesthesia. I, I leave that to smarter people. But I think it's one of the most difficult cases I've ever had has been obstetrics. And obstetrics is very difficult because you have two, two, you know, two lives in your hands. You have the baby and the mother. And now I think we all use regional anesthesia for epidurals, for labor and delivery. But in the past, some people use general anesthesia. And, you know, most mothers have just eaten and they come in with a full stomach and a large tumor belly mass. 
and that presses on the stomach and pushes it up and it goes down into the lungs. So that's the most difficult because they can aspirate and a lot of food can go down there and that's not good for the mother or the baby. So that that's my most difficult case is, is obstetrics. Wow. Yeah, that seems like that would be so difficult. Yeah. Um, is there a type of person that you, when you meet and you think, this is this is the person that has what it takes to be great in your profession? Uh, I do. I, I have that in the back of my mind. Someone who pays attention to detail, someone who loves teamwork, someone who's not afraid, but someone who's smarter than they are someone who's willing to go the extra mile to read about new things in the new journals. Those are the people you want in, in, in our specialty because it's life and death all the time. Just a, a small incident can cause brain damage. So you got to be very careful and you got to be pay attention. So vigilance is the key. All right. Um, um, I'm just looking. We, we, we've got a few more minutes. Um, what would you like to share with people? Um, we, I think we've now gotten to a point in time where everybody is going to, at some point in time, find themselves in this position. And, and as I said, I was one of those that thought, yeah, maybe other people are, but not me. Um, I'm past that. But um, knowing that we, we really need to look at the fact that we're all going to find ourselves in this position, um, what would you like to share with with people in general? Uh, and I know you've covered a lot of it in the book, but for those people, if they're not going to be reading the book, what are some of the key points you want them to take away from this? Well, I think you look at your risk. What is your risk of having to have a, a hip replaced or a knee replaced or spine surgery? And if you think you might have that sometime in the future, you would, might want to read the book, Anesthesia Without Fear because it tells you the anesthetics that are the safest for you and the pain techniques that are safest post-operatively can, that can lead you through rehab. So you can get up and walk steps, you know, the same day of your surgery. If you're, you know, if you're, as we said earlier, if you're obese and have diabetes mellitus and smoke, then you're, you're probably going to get, need a lot of intensive care. So post-op after that, you would make sure that they had an intensive care unit where there were intensivists that would be there to help you. And, and depending on your, your disease, whether it's uh, you're having a lung resection or open heart or a brain tumor removed. So you need to, you can have a neurointensive care unit, which would be very important if you had a brain tumor. So those are all the things you can think about that as you grow older, you might have, and then you can read about those in this book in preparation for the possibility of that happening. And if it happens, you feel better when you go to the operating room. Wow. Yeah. Um, and again, I just, I, uh, as I said earlier, um, you know, I, I now wish that I would have uh, read this prior to my event. <laughs> uh, but, uh, it was good that I had it. It was something I started reading actually as soon as I was coming in and going through my own recovery. Um, so James, I just got to tell you, I, I'm just, uh, I'm so glad that you touched on a subject that I think a lot of people uh, don't think of until they get into that situation. Uh, so I don't know. I just want to thank you not only for writing the book, but for coming on the show. Um, what's, what's next for you? Well, I think, I think I'd like to continue to update this, particularly on the future of anesthesia and also the newer techniques for pain management for chronic pain syndrome. Those would be the things. That, and also memory. We're working on an enzyme that converts short-term memory to long-term memory. And it seems that anesthesia interferes with that enzyme. So we're trying to work that out as well. Uh, can you share a little bit more in regards to that? That's very interesting to me. And, and, and again, I... I usually, when I do this show, I don't make it about me, uh, but I have, I've had a little bit of difficulty memory wise, uh, finding certain words, uh, and stuff, you know, after, after having had this, um, you know, this, this heart issue, 
Um, so share with me some of the things that are with all of us, some of the things that you're uh, that you see in the near future as it relates to memory. Well, I think the biggest thing is that if you're having open heart surgery, then inhalation anesthetics are used. They can damage the brain during the procedure because it's a long procedure. And in post-op, you would you would have changes in personality and might even have some weakness in one side or the other. But again, we can monitor the depth of anesthesia and not get too deep. But it's better there to have a total intravenous anesthetic. And also in children under two years of age, you don't want to use a lot of the inhalation or volatile anesthetics because it's like a fetal alcohol syndrome. It's fetal anesthetic syndrome because it could cause some problems. So I think those are the things that we need to keep in mind as we go forward into the future. And hopefully we'll have ways to prevent that. Now, in, in my situation, could it be that there was a period of time uh, immediately after the heart attack that maybe blood just wasn't getting to a certain area rather than it doesn't seem like it was anything that would have been from the anesthesia? Does that make more sense? Well, I, th I think that makes sense. You could have low blood pressure either before or during anesthesia. We have to watch that very carefully. Oh, you get a little bit hypotensive that you don't perfuse your brain well enough to keep it going. But with your case, it also could be something from the stent that got loose in the circulation and went to your brain. You know, there's lots of debris because it's calcium and plaque and cholesterol in, in that artery. So they're, they're messing with that. So, you know, they downstream, something can get loose and go to your brain. I'm not saying that's what happened. Right. But there, there are lots of things that are, that are possible for that. Well, uh, James, I just got to tell you again, thank you so much uh, again for everybody out there. Um, you know, the book is Anesthesia Without Fear, the Informed Consumer's Guide to Safe Surgery and Chronic Pain Relief. Um, I assume that we they can get it anywhere books are sold. Right. And you can order from Amazon. And if you like it, give it a review. Yeah. Yes, please do. Um, in fact, not only give it a review, uh, you know, share it with us, you know, contact us, let us know what you thought. Um, if people would like to get a hold of you, what is the best way for them to do that? On the website at anesthesiawithoutfear.com. All right. And again, if you're out there driving, and I know you probably aren't going to be able to spell that as you're driving, um, we'll make sure that we have it in our show notes. Uh, you know, the website, so you can go to uh, answers.network and we will have that information there. So, um, and again, Jim, thank you so much. Appreciate everything that you're doing for, for us in your work and taking the time to come on the show and share it with us. Thank you very much, Alan. It was my pleasure. All right. Now for everybody out there, please be with us next week when we're joined by Jim White and he's going to discuss his new book, how to be the parent your teenager needs you to be without all the fighting, frustration, or fear of doing it wrong. Um, <clears throat> again, I want to I, I want to apologize. Um, I'm still having some issues with my throat. Uh, and I think it has to do with a reaction that I've had to the medication. I want to thank all of you for uh, sticking with us, for tuning in, and uh, know that um, I'm going to do everything I can to bring you people that can help make your life better uh, as well as your loved ones. So, and again, if uh, please visit our archives of past interviews. You can do it at answers.network or just subscribe to the show. You can do it through Apple Podcast, iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, Rumble, Spreaker, and so many other popular podcast formats. If you like what you hear, please leave a review. Uh, it helps us reach more people, and I want you to know we greatly appreciate it. Um, we also have information that you can find on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. And stop by those pages. Uh, check out some of our latest shows. If you like them, please like us and spread the word. So for everybody out there, be good human beings and be with us again next week on Answers Network. You're listening to Answers Network with Alan Cardoza, only on L.A. Talk Radio.